the Lord Jesus did what he saw the Father do. We are called to do the Father's works just like Jesus. In this message, our goal is to learn what Jesus taught about the Father's works, discover how Jesus walked with the Father, and learn how we can walk with the Father and do his works. Declaration this morning, just declare what God has said about us and what God is doing in us and through us. So if you would hold your Bible high up in the air, let's make our declaration together. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I am saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I am a minister of God a servant of Christ, and a channel of his blessing to many people. I receive his word. I believe his word. And I live by his word. Christ is my master. And to him, I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated, please. This morning, I want us to take some time and study on this topic, the Father's works, or you want to call it the works of the Father or the Father's works. Now, um, originally, we intended to uh, do this across two Sundays, today and next Sunday, Uh, but next Sunday here at Central Uh, We'll be having a guest speaker, Max Myers. He will be here with us next Sunday. I haven't met him personally yet, but um, Max Myers, is uh, uh, he was an Assemblies of God pastor in the U.S. for many years. Um, Then he, uh, after that, he uh, worked with Randy Clark, and some of you may know uh, Randy Clark, the uh, Global School of Supernatural Ministry. He was the director of that school. Super, uh, School of Supernatural Ministry for several years, and um, then uh, after that, uh, I think recently, uh, for two years, he ran for uh, for the governor of Pennsylvania. Got that right? So he was one of the candidates running for that. So he's going to be here with us next Sunday morning. So I want to encourage you uh, to come. We've asked him specifically to continue on the same theme that we're talking about uh, on on healing and and so on. So he will be on that theme as well. So I encourage you to come, bring your friends, bring others to uh, just come and receive. Um, so what we're going to do this morning is actually condense a two-part sermon into one Sunday. So you ready for that? Okay. So you got to stretch your brains out a little bit. <laughs> uh, just try to receive. I'm going to do that, try to condense both these messages into one. So we did that so that we can accommodate him uh, for our next Sunday service. But really what we're doing is that uh, we are preparing uh, to go into an extended season, July, August, September, three months, where as a church, we will dwell on this, on this whole theme on ministering, healing, and deliverance. So for three months, July, August, September, we are all going to be studying on that, looking into that, uh, learning about ministering, healing, and deliverance. Is it okay? Right? And, 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 and our real desire, intent, is that all of us will be equipped to go out and do the works of the Father. Amen? That all of us will be equipped to do that. We go out and, and, and do the works of the Father, uh, minister healings, miracles, deliverances, and then and, and come back with these great stories. And, but most of all, our, our, our desire is to impact the city. Our city is going to be impacted, not because we have some great evangelists coming in for a few days, but our city is going to be impacted because we have an army of people going all across in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ, doing the works of the Father. That's how our city is going to be affected. When you and I, when we are all equipped to go forth and do these things. Amen? So that's what we're going to get into July, August, September. We'll we'll do that. Um, Just to give you an idea, then right after that, we're going to spend a month 
talking about uh, how uh, our answers to questions on, on, on reasons for our faith. We'll spend uh, October doing that. November, December, Jan, we'll get into a, what we call a series on power to change. And uh, February onwards, we're talking about God's word, how we apply God's word to the workplace. So we'll talk about timeless truths for the workplace. That will take us into April of next year. So you all wrote it down, right? <laughs> so we know what we're doing all the way through. Uh, so that's kind of the journey we're taking uh, as a church, as, as, as we're going to build, uh, build these things up, really, because we want to see uh, us as a people impacting our city. Amen? And, and, and so it's very intentional why we... Uh, uh, the journey that we're making as, as the Spirit of the Lord leads us, we're laying line upon line, building block upon block so that God can have a people that he can use in the city for his glory. So let's talk about the Father's works. We're going to cover a lot of ground. So if you can't write everything down, it's okay. You'll get the entirety of the sermon on, on the website, so you'll find everything there. Um, you know, when we talk, we look at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four Gospels essentially are telling us the same story, uh, but from, you know, four different viewpoints and to four different audiences. You know, it's the same story, but four different points of view on the same story. So let's, let's say, you know, uh, somebody's watching the football match. I mean, you have a group of people watching the football match. How many of you have last, last night? Or, you know, <laughs> watching? All right. So somebody's watching and, you know, let's say you have four people watching the same the same goal that was scored, right? So you ask me, how was the goal scored? So one person is going to talk, man, you know that the pass that came in through and the way the ball curved, that's the high point. I mean, if that pass hadn't come, the goal would not have been scored, right? Somebody say, how was the goal scored? Man, you saw the way he headed the ball in. I mean, the, you know, so they're going to talk about that, right? And somebody, how was the goal scored? Man, the goalkeeper, you know, he was jumping the wrong direction. That's why it happened. You know? <laughs> hey, it's all the same thing. But four different viewpoints of the same thing. And none of them are wrong. All of them are right. Just that the emphasis, the focus was slightly different. One was looking at the pass. One was looking at the header. One was looking at the goalkeeper. And, you know, and others were looking at the backs. Man, they never did anything, you know. They just let the other forward come through. So it's all, so the four gospels are like that. It's, it's the same story, but four different Points, uh, four different viewpoints, and they're writing to four different audiences. Uh, Matthew was written by a Jew to the Jewish people about a Jew in order to prove the, that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. So that's why Matthew was written. You know, to, to show that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. So Matthew in his gospel, about 40 Old Testament references are in the gospel of Matthew. Because he wants to reiterate over and over again. Hey, Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. Jesus fulfilled, that's why he is the Messiah. Mark was written uh, to Romans, to, uh, to a Roman audience to show Christ or to portray Christ as the servant. To show how, although he's a servant, He's so powerful because the Romans were all, all about authority and power. But Mark is presenting Christ as a servant. So he talks about the, the son of man, the servant, the, man who, the son of man who came to serve uh, people. Luke is a physician. So he is all about accuracy and details. You know? So he's very detailed, wants to gather in all the details. So when he talks about a story, he tries to give you all the details uh, about that incident. Luke, Luke is very, very... Um, uh, detailed. Uh, he was the only Gentile writer in the Bible uh, presenting the story, the, uh, the gospel story there about Jesus. And he's presenting the Son of Man. He, he, he's looking at the humanity of Christ. That Jesus was actually very human. And he talks, and he goes, that's why he starts by tracing his roots, the genealogy of Christ. And he presents Christ, the human side of Christ, the humanity of Christ. John is very different from all the other three. John's intent is to present the deity of Christ. So he doesn't trace back the genealogy, the human genealogy. He goes back all the way to in the beginning was the word. So we're talking about a divine person. We're not talking about just, 
you know, a, a, a Jew. We're not just talking about somebody who came as a servant. We're not just talking about somebody who was uh, the son of man, who was very human and all of that. But we're talking about somebody who's divine. So he goes back, he bypasses the humanity of Christ and he goes back to the divinity, the deity of Christ and says, this is who he is. And in the Gospel of John, there is a lot of focus on the relationship of the Son of God with the Father. Which you don't find in the other three Gospels. John is emphasizing the deity, Christ as the Son of God and how he walked with the Father. So this morning, uh, uh, in this message, we're going to focus a lot in the, in the Gospel of John. And we have a threefold objective in this message here this morning. We want to, um, where was I in my notes here? Okay. We want to learn what Jesus taught about the Father's works. What did Jesus say about the Father's works? We want to discover how Jesus walked with the Father to do his works. Right? So first, what did Jesus say about the Father's works? Second, how did he walk with the Father in order to do those works? And third is... What can we learn on how we can walk with the Father to do His works? So that's what this message is about, the Father's works. Are we all right, together so far? Right? What did Jesus teach about the Father's works? And how did He walk with the Father? What was His relationship with the Father like which enabled Him to do these works? And we want to take lessons back from that saying, okay, this is how we can walk with the Father to do the Father's works. Uh, uh, it was intended for two Sundays. We're going to compress it into one Sunday. Let's do that. I'm going to run through several things very, very quickly on what Jesus said. Uh, and then we'll spend some time on a few things that we want to highlight. You all remember that, you know, Jesus, as a 12-year-old, he made his opening statement. You know, his parents came seeking him in the temple, right? And, uh, you know, I think they were looking for him on the football field. They didn't find him there. Uh, they looked, looked for him on the cricket field. They didn't find him there. They went to the hockey field, basketball. It's not any of those places. Finally said, okay, the only place left is the temple. Let's go see what happened. And there they find Jesus sitting in the temple. He's having this great intense conversations with all people, you know, several times now his age. And they come and say, son, why are you doing this to us? And what did he say? In Luke 2 and 49, Jesus says, don't you know I must be about my father's business? So Jesus came. To do the Father's work. He came to do the Father's will. That's in Hebrews 10 verses 5 and 7. Uh, uh, Jesus said, you know, it's the right of Hebrews says, uh, quoting from the Old Testament about the Lord. He says, you gave me a body in order and lo I come to do thy will. He came to do the Father's will. He came in the Father's name. Uh, in John 5, 43, again in John 10, 25, he said, I have come in my Father's name. So what does it mean to come in the Father's name? It means you come by His authority. Right? Jesus told us, you go in my name. So we've been commissioned to go in His name, by His authority. Jesus said, I come in my Father's name. Right? That means I'm coming because of, by His authority, I'm here. He, he revealed. Sonship glory. Uh, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So the glory of God given to him, he, he manifests through miracles. This is John 1, 14, John 2, 11. He called the temple my Father's house. So you look at it and you say, the temple. He doesn't look, oh, this is just another place. No, this is my Father's house. And he changed off uh, the money changers. And he got people in and he healed them in the temple. And part of the father's works was to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. For this purpose, the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That is part of what he did. He came to do the father's works, which is he came to destroy the works of the devil. But I want you to see a couple of things. Now, if you turn with me in your Bible to so John chapter 5. 
when Jesus spoke about the Father's works, some important statements that he made. He first of all, he said that the works of the Father, which he did, were more important than the testimony of man. So you find this in this passage in John chapter 5, verses 31 to 30, 36. This is right after Jesus heals the man uh, by the pool of Bethesda. He healed him, the cripple. And this is what he says in John 5, 31 to 36. He says, if I bear witness of myself and my, my witness is not true, there is another who bears witness of me and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to, to John and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Notice what he's saying. He's saying, all of you went and listened to John. And John was a great witness. In fact, Jesus called him the greatest Old Testament prophet. But you know what Jesus said? I do not receive testimony from man. It's not about some man saying something about me. He says, I have a witness that is greater than John's. What is it? The works that I do in my father's name. That means the father's works are more important. Doing the father's works are more important than any testimony of man. Are you with me so far? Or are you falling asleep like now, yesterday I was in Vellore. It was so hot. You know, and so like we, we purposely went to a restaurant just to sit in that AC room there. <laughs> but you all awake? What did Jesus say? I do not receive testimony from man. Now, this is the greatest Old Testament prophet, John, speaking. It's not like, you know, some, some little person speaking. No, this is John. The old, greatest Old Testament prophet. He's prophesying about Jesus. And saying this is the Lamb of God and so on. But Jesus says, I do not receive testimony of man. I have a greater witness than John. What is that greater witness? He didn't say, you know, hey guys, do you remember when I was born? There were angels singing. How many of you had angels singing on your birthday? <laughs> Power, guys, don't you know when I was born? There was a star that was shining so brightly that men from the east followed the star. How many of you had a shining star on your birthday? You know? He didn't point to any of that. He said, the works that I do in my father's name, the father's works, they bear witness of me. So the father's works is more important than the testimony of Man, doing the Father's works. So you and I must understand. You know, some of us saying, oh, Pastor Ash has never said anything good about me. Hey, relax. Don't worry about the testimony of man. Right? Wait. You know, desire the Father's works because they are a greater testimony than any recommendation man can give you. Are you with me? The Father's works. They are a greater testimony than what man can say. Another important passage here is in John chapter 9. Um, this is about the healing of the blind man. And let's just look at a few verses here in John chapter 9, verse 1 onwards. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. So, you know, here's a man who was born blind and suddenly all of these disciples become very theological. Right? Lord, 
Whom, who sin? I mean, is there some deep root ancestral sin, you know? Is it his father or did he sin? No, I'm not against, I mean, let me say this, put it this way. See, there are times when we need to repent of sin, any known sin. But we cannot attribute every sickness because of sin. Are you with me? So don't go simply to everybody and say, you know, the way you're going to get healed is if you repent of all the sins you did from the day you were born. That is not the answer. Are you with me? There is a time and a place for repenting of sin, but don't use that one little thing to cure every disease. It's not that. The same question, these disciples are asking, Lord, who sinned? He, his father, maybe his grandfather, maybe his great, great grandfather. Said, no, 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 none of that. I want you to look at it like this. He's blind, but see this as an opportunity for the works of the father to be manifested in him. Right? And how did Jesus manifest the works? I mean, the works of the Father, what was it? The blind man received his sight. That was the works of the Father. So when you, you and I, when we see somebody who is sick or is diseased or troubled in any way, let's not try to, you know, point fingers and say, oh, did he sin? This is grandfather sin. What? No, 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 no. Look at it as an opportunity for the works of the Father to be done in him. Say, God, here's an opportunity. Let's do the Father's works. Let's get him healed. What did Jesus say? He said, I must work the works of the one who sent me. I must do the Father's works. So when somebody is sick, it's an opportunity for us to step in and say, let's do the Father's works. So what is the Father's works? The Father's works is to make blind eyes see. The Father's works is to make the sick well. The Father's work is to heal those who are broken. That's the Father's works. So when you see broken, when, when you see people are broken, when you see people are hurting, step in there and say, it's time to do the Father's works. Let's do it. Instead of trying to put the blame on people and, you know, all, all these kinds of things. No, just step in, do the Father's works. And he also mentions this. He says, I must do the Father's works now while it's day. Meaning, you know, don't miss this opportunity. Don't let it go by. Step in and do it. Another important passage here in John chapter 10 where Jesus spoke about the works of the Father. And this is very, very powerful. We're going to look at some verses here in John chapter 10. We'll read verses 25, 32, 33, 37, 38. So here are the Jews who come to him and, and they ask this question in verse 24. They say, you know, then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Verse 25, Jesus said, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So when these people come and say, you know, are you really the Messiah? Once again, what does Jesus point to? Now, he could have said, hey, when John was baptizing me, didn't he hear the voice from heaven? It was broadcast all across all radio stations. You know? Didn't you see that Tao descending? I mean, how many of you had Tao's on you? Come on you, you know. I mean, he could have pointed to all these things. He did not. So when they asked him, are you the Messiah? What did he point to? He said, the works that I do in my father's. That's testimony. The Father's works. And he continues in that chapter. We'll skip down. Uh, verse 32, he says, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those are you ready to stone me? Look at verses 37 and 38. Here's what Jesus said. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe. Read it again. It's in the Bible. What did Jesus say? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. Think about this. Jesus didn't expect his audience to believe him because of his great sermons. Is that right? 
Say, look at all the parables I'm telling you. Look at all those wonderful beatitudes. No. He did not expect his audience to believe him because of his great sermons. He said, if I do not do the Father's works, don't believe in me. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? Don't believe in me. If you don't see me do my Father's works. So here's what I want to challenge us with. I'm not saying this to condemn us. I'm pointing fingers at me as much as I'm challenging all of us. Two things. I think it's unfair for us to expect people to believe in a message without the Father's works. Is that right? I think it's unfair. And I think it's time we as a church, as the people of God, came to the same standards of Jesus and said, if we do not do the Father's works, don't believe us. Most of our churches were pretty empty. But this is the importance Jesus gave to the Father's works. To the point he said, if I do not do the Father's works, don't believe me. Then he continues with the next words. He says, but if I do, though you do not believe me, that means you don't believe what I'm saying, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So even if you don't believe what I say, if, but if I'm doing the works, then even if you don't believe what I'm saying, you've got to believe the works, the Father's works. So question. How important were the Father's works to Jesus? Very important. More important than the testimony of man. More important than even his sermons he preached. Are you all with me so far? Yes? So pastor, let's change the sermon, you know, talk about something else. <laughs> the reason we're going into this is to challenge ourselves saying look if Jesus set this standard let's not settle for something else I mean it's good to have good preaching and good teaching it's good to have you know all of the technology that we use in church I mean I'm not against all of that but I'm saying in as much as we have all that there is something more important it's for us to do the father's works and until we see those works being done we should not stop pressing in Amen? You shouldn't stop. That's the standard Jesus set. Two more passages on what Jesus said about the Father's works in John 14, and I'll just summarize this. John 14, verses 1 through 12. You know, Jesus is one day, he's talking, he, you know, just imagine this. Jesus talking to his disciples and he's kind of getting them ready for his departure. He says, you know, guys, I don't want you to be troubled. I'm about to tell you something. Don't get anxious, just relax. And they're all listening. He says, you know, uh, in my father's house are many mansions. And I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. But relax. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And the way you know, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. So you can listen, imagine these 12 people sitting around Jesus. Saying, oh, let's talk about father's house, mansions. So Philip comes up with this question. Lord Jesus we don't know where you're going, and we don't know the way. I mean, at least give us the address before you go, you know. Philip, have I been with you so long that you haven't understood all this? You know, I'm going to my father's house. And he says, but Jesus, in all these three years, you never took us to your house. You never showed us your father. Show us your father. It's enough for us. That's what Philip says. 
Show us the Father. Jesus answers, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you heard me, you heard the Father. And then to his own disciples, he says this very thing in John chapter 14. And verse 10 and 11, verses 10 and 11. Do you not believe that I am the Father, the Father is in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Look at verse 11. And he says, guys, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So to his own disciples, he says, you take my word for it. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. If you can't take my word for it, at least believe me for the sake of the works themselves. For the sake of the works. So you've been with me for, you've been with me for three and a half years. You've seen the works. If you can't believe what I'm saying, you can't take my word for it that I'm in the Father, the Father's in me. At least believe me because of all that you've seen me do. The Father's works. To his own disciples. So to his own disciples. He says, it's the Father's works that authenticate who I am, that, that validate who I am. And in that context, he gives verse 12, which is, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will also do. Meaning to tell us that the way future generations of believers are going to authenticate and validate who Jesus Christ is, is the same way, by doing the Father's works. So today the world will come and tell us, show us the Father, or show us heaven, this, that, and all. Okay, believe, either you believe what we're saying, or else believe us because of the works you do. He who believes in me, the works I do, greater works than these, uh, he will do also and greater works. So today's generation of believers, how are we going to authenticate Jesus Christ to the world? It's going to be by the same way, by doing the Father's works. And that's what we as a church, we as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we as people who want to be witnesses for him, must take this seriously. That we must do the Father's works. You must do it. Only then the world is going to believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he is. In John 15, 24, Jesus says this in John 15, 24 about the Father's works. He says, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated me and my Father. Meaning, the work, seeing the works of the Father is conclusive proof of who Jesus is and it leaves us with no other option. He says, if I didn't do the works, then they can be excused. But now I have done the works, they've seen it, they are without excuse. And their reaction is to hate me and hate my Father. So leave it, doing the Father's works leaves people now without an excuse. We've got to do that. How did Jesus walk with the Father? Again, this itself is, is, is a huge sermon. But let's, let's try to condense this. His relationship with the Father is what really enabled these works to be done. And that's very important for us. The fruit of our relationship with Jesus is the power to do the works of Jesus. If we try to pursue doing the works without the relationship, we are going to, we will not be able to produce that. We will not be able to produce those, those, that fruit. The fruit of our relationship with Jesus is the power to do those works. So this relationship with the Lord is very important. 
So look at the relationship Jesus had with the Father. And we'll just highlight some of these things. Uh, they're very, very important. In John 1.18, Jesus said, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who, I who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. He didn't say, I was once upon a time in the bosom of the Father a long time ago. No. I am in the bosom of the? What does it mean to be in the bosom of the Father? The Amplified Bible puts it, renders it like this. It says, to be in the intimate presence of the Father. So what does he say about himself? He says, the Son the only begotten son who is in the intimate presence of the father. And out of being in that intimate presence of the father, he declares him. He is able to reveal him. Something very important for us to learn. That we can only reveal the father as we are in the bosom of the father. As we abide in the intimate presence of the Are you with me so far? So we need to walk with the Father the way Christ walked. He said, the Son of God who is in the bosom, in the intimate presence of the Father. He reveals Him. You cannot reveal the Father if you're not, first of all, in the intimate presence of the Father. That's why being in His presence is so important. Because out of that comes the ability to reveal the Father. So the time you spent... To be in the bosom of the Father, to be in the intimate presence of the Father is never wasted time. That is what empowers you and me to reveal, to declare to the world, to do the Father's works so people will know Him. Amen? And you find this in the Gospels, how Jesus spent time alone in the Father. He would get up early in the morning. He'd go away to a quiet place and pray. He would spend the whole night in prayer. There were times when after he ministered to the crowds, he would say, okay, crowds, you need to go away. I need to be by myself. I'm not taking up my, picking up my cell phone. I'm not looking at my emails. Don't SMS me nothing because I need to be in the intimate presence of the pastor. I can't stop looking at emails every hour because if I don't look at my emails, the world will stop. Relax. The world doesn't revolve around your emails or your phone. Turn it off. Don't do your emails for a day or two. Be in the bosom of the. It's only that is what empowers you then to come out and reveal the Father. To do the works of the Father. That's what Jesus did. He said things like this in John 3.35. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. Father loves the son. He's just released everything into his hand. The reason the father could release everything into his hand was there was so much trust. He knew the son will not misuse it. See, there is this element where you and I need to prove ourselves trustworthy. Worthy of trust. Paul said about his own life, he said, Jesus put me into the ministry finding me trustworthy. He found me trustworthy. He found me faithful. So he put me into the ministry. He put me in this place. Jesus said, the Father's given everything in my hands because he loves, he loves me. He's put everything in my hands. The reason the Father could place that there was he found the Son trustworthy. He's my beloved Son. I can trust him. I can put everything in his hands. Jesus said in John 4.34 that, my food, that is my nourishment, my sustenance, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My food, my very sustenance, is to do his will and to finish his work. So for us, we must make this the focus. I want to do his will for my life. That's it. Focus on it. That's how Jesus walked to the Father. It's, I want to do His will. And that's nourishment. I mean, that gives me strength. That gives me the energy. 
When he healed the crippled man in the pool of Bethesda, he, he said things like this in John 5, 17. My father's been working now and I've been working. Meaning, I do, my father's working, I'm also working. This is my father's work, healing the cripple. That's my father's work. And so I'm just co-working. I'm working, laboring together with the father. That's, that was his relationship. It was a co-worker. Father works, I work. And the same passage in verses 19 and 20, he said this. He said, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. So he says, I'm watching. Whatever the father's doing, that's what I'm doing. And then he says in verse 20, the father will show me greater things and I will do greater things. Right? So here's this element that we can pray and say, God, show us greater things that you want done. And as we walk with God, we will begin to see greater things. So you pray and say, God, show me greater things than what we've seen. Thank God for the healing of kidney stones and this kidney stones disappearing. But God, show us greater things. Now, thank God for this miracle, but God, show us greater things. Jesus said, the Father will show me greater things and I will do greater things that you may marvel, that you will be astounded and amazed. About his doing, in John 5 and verse 30, he says, I can do of myself, not, I can of myself do nothing because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So we are so committed, saying, look, you know, I'm not going to operate out of my own abilities. I want to operate according to the Father's will. In his doing, that's how he walked with the Father. In his teaching, and I'm skipping several verses here. I just want to uh, bring this to a close. In his teaching, he said in, in John 7, 14 through 16, he said, my doctrine, John 7, 16, my doctrine is not mine, but him who sent me. In John 8, 28, he said, as my father taught me, I speak these things. In John 8, 38, he said, I speak what I have seen with my father. That even when I speak, I'm speaking what the father is putting in my heart. What he's teaching me is what I'm speaking. So how did Jesus walk with the father? He walked in a very intimate relationship with the Father. He walked in total submission to the will of the Father. He walked in a place where he only did what he saw the Father do. He walked in a place where he only spoke and taught the things he learned from the Father. Are you with me so far? That was the kind of relationship he had. To the point, uh, and, uh, and he, where Jesus said this in John 6, and verse 57, he says, I live because of the Father. Meaning my very life depends on my relationship with the Father. I live because of the Father. Several of the scriptures, he talks about his obedience to the Father. He says, you know, I, I, I always do what's pleasing to him. I do my Father's commandment. Uh, and so on. And I'm skipping all those this, this verses of scripture. But the, these are the highlights, the key points of his relationship with the father. He was in the bosom of the father, in a place of intimacy. His whole life was one that was based on the relationship with the father. I live because of the father. He was committed to doing the will of the father. I want to do what he wants me to do. That's it. I'll only do what he tells me. I'll only say what he tells me. So his life was one of complete surrender to the Father. The last thing I want to talk about now is the challenge for you and me that Jesus left us with. You know, you and I are called to fellowship. We are called to fellowship with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. Means we are called to the same kind of relationship that Jesus had with the Father. You and I are called to that. There are scriptures there on that. First John 1, 3, John writes, he says, But truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So we are called to walk in that same kind of relationship with the Father as Jesus walked. And we have been left, I'm just getting ready to close here. We've been sent to do the Father's works. In John 20, verse 21, Jesus said, As my Father sent me, even so I am sending you. 
Let's say that together. Right? Just wake your neighbor up saying, he's getting ready to close. Wake up. <laughs> Let's say this together. As my father sent me, even so, I send you. That's what Jesus told us. He said, look, the way my father sent me, I am sending you. Go. Go do the father's works. So, you and I have been left with this mandate, with this commission to do the Father's works. And we should not make it optional, neither should we make it secondary. No. We should give the same importance that Jesus gave to doing the Father's works. Same importance. So that's our desire as a church. We are not going to go away from the sound teaching of the word and, and addressing all areas of life and growing up and all things to be like Jesus. We're not going to depart from that. We are going to continue to grow in every area. But while, while we do that, we need to press in and say, God, make us a people who are doing the Father's works. Help us to walk with you the way Christ walked so that we can do the works you want done through us. Because outside in this world, there are people who are hurting, who are sick, or oppressed, troubled. There are people who need help. God's got the answer. But we need to be channels by which this can be released to them. That they can receive, know, experience Jesus Christ. So I want to invite us as a congregation, as a church, to make this journey. Till all of us are doing the Father's works. Like Jesus. All of us. Say, but pastor, I've never been to Bible college. I never, I'm not seminary trained. I'm not this. No, no, let's not make excuses. It's not about that. It's about being in the bosom of the Father. It's about being in the presence of the Father, in that intimate presence. And out of that, we're able to say the things he says and do the things he does. It's about that. It's not about all the other things. I mean, if you want to go to Bible college, you want to go to seminary, you want to go get training, all that's nice. I'm not discrediting that. But the real issue is we must be in the presence of the Father, in the intimate presence of the Father, and then out of that, do the Father's works. Set the captives free. Heal the brokenhearted. Bring healing to those who are diseased and oppressed and, 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 and cast out devils and destroy the works of darkness. Amen? That's the journey we're going to make as a church. And I want to invite us uh, together to press in as we pray, as we seek God, saying, God, make us a people who will be like Jesus doing the Father's works. We will walk with you the way Jesus walked with you. He set us an example. We want to follow that. We want to model that. We want to press in there. And right where you are, in your school, in your college, in your place of work, wherever you go, we must press in. And, and in, in those places, do the Father's works. So Jesus didn't stay in one particular synagogue and said, all of you come to me in the synagogue, you see the Father's works. It happens every Friday night, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. He didn't do that. You find Jesus walking in the marketplace. You find Jesus walking all the dusty streets. He went across so many cities. Uh, he just went where people are. And that's where the Father's works happens. Amen? And each one of us are called to do that. Let's rise to our feet this morning, please. I call our worship team up. I know it's already time, but let's take a few moments where I want you to pray personally and say, God, 
Help me to do the Father's works. Jesus said, as my Father sent me, I am sending you. Meaning to do the same works. To do the Father's works. Would you pray? You might be a young person. Just in college or in school. God can use you. You may be an elderly person. God can use you. Maybe a professional. God can use you. Whoever you are, God can use you. Would you just simply pray and say, God, I want to do the Father's works. And then we're going to pray for us as a church. Lord, take us there. Teach us, train us, and, 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 and draw us even more into that intimate presence of the Father. So that from there, eat, we as a people can, can do the Father's works and impact our city and our nation. So that the world will see and know who Jesus Christ is. Just go ahead and pray right now. Say, Lord, we want to be a people who will do the Father's works. If Jesus would say something like this, if he would say, if I do not do the works of my Father, don't believe in me. But we should rise up and say the same thing. We want to see the Father's works. We want to do the Father's works. Father, we just pray here, God, that each one of us in this church, in this body, that you will teach us, train us, and empower us to do the Father's works. Father's works. I pray you'll use each and every one of us to do the Father's works. That no sickness or disease or no demonic work will be able to stand against us as we go in the name of Jesus. We will see, Lord, the powers of darkness retreat and the captives set free and bondages broken and lives delivered and the sick healed. We will see these things happen. Hurting people receiving wholeness. Miracles taking place that changes life situations and circumstances oh God that these works will be manifested and released through us so that people millions, millions in our city will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior Take a moment right now to pray for us as a church and say, God, it's not just for me, but I'm praying for the church. I'm praying for this whole body, for this whole church of God. That make us a people who will do the Father's work. And whatever it takes, God, whatever it takes, transform us by your spirit. Bring us to be that kind of people, God. Pray, pray for the church. Pray for the people. Because there's a city that's waiting to see and know Jesus Christ is Lord. There's a nation that's waiting that needs to know Jesus is Lord.
Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. Next weekend, this coming weekend, we have the weekend school of prophetic ministries happening on Saturday and Sunday. Those who want to come for that, you're welcome. Next Sunday, we have Max Myers here ministering with us. So, we invite your friends if they would like to come as well. Amen? Let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us, empowering us, encouraging us, strengthening us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Go be a blessing. See you again. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.